kind of, what does it mean to walk in newness of life? What does that mean? So we're going to talk about that. Today we're going to introduce it. We're going to introduce the idea that Paul has remarked about walk in newness of life. I mean, where did we get newness of life to walk in it? See? And what does that mean? Well, aren't you curious about that? I was. I mean, what does that mean? If, if I'm going to walk in newness of life, what does that really mean? And so we're, we're, over, the, over the next weeks, we're going to discuss that. Today, we're going to introduce it to you. It comes off from the whole study of positional sanctification. If you didn't understand that, I couldn't take you where I got to take you today. But since you already know that because we've taught it, and uh, if you haven't done that, you might be visiting with us on the Internet, then you should go back to our website and take a look at uh, the posting under positional truth that's recent. Well, let's have a word of prayer. Remember that the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit in the assembly hour is based on John 14, 26. Now, there are many passages, but that's my favorite, and so I use it. <laughs> Since I'm the teacher, I use it. And what it teaches you is that the indwelling of the Holy Spirit has been given to you in Bible study to teach you the Word and to recall it in your life. Teach and recall. That's a powerful idea. He will teach it. If you will open through volition, if you will open your life to the teaching of the Word of God, He will teach it to you. And not only will He teach it to you, but He will recall it. You know what recall is? It's a sign of spiritual maturing in your life. When he recalls the word of God in your soul, it should make you happy. It should go like, wow, I knew that. I'm so thankful I go to Bible study and learn that. I mean, you could be over, setting over a cup of, of coffee or something, and this person needs to hear some revelation from God that you have in your soul. And you're able to give that to that person through the recalling principle of the Word of God. And it should make you proud. It should make you feel happy inside. That's because of that indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. So, you're either spiritual or carnal. If you're carnal, the evidence is personal sin. What do I do with it? I confess it. First John 1, 9, I confess it. Don't let the devil steal that passage from you. Don't let him steal that from you. Don't let him steal that from you. Because he can put you in a heap of trouble if you don't use it. So he knows that, whether you know it or not. Don't let him take 1 John 1, 9 from you. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just through the, through the work of Jesus Christ to forgive us and to cleanse us from all of our sins. That's a marvelous idea. And so... I give you a moment of silence through your priesthood to confess sin before Bible study, okay? First Peter 2, 5 and 9, we're all believer priests. We live in the church age. I'm going to give you a moment of silence. Well, Father, we're thankful today for each person that's come our way to study with us. I pray the Holy Spirit would minister the revelation of the, of the Word of God in my soul to them. And as it works in their soul, to bring revelation to them. I pray today, Father, for our church, for those who are going through COVID, for those who are struggling in their life for two years of this kind of pandemic, Everybody's talking about a, a new normal. And scripturally, they're right. Just as there were rumors of war and rumors of war during the church age, there will be a pandemic of diseases. it will become so great that during the tribulation, a third of the population will be lost. 
and we're being prepared for that. We, the church father, need to really understand the crisis that we're in. And not just in America, globally. Globally. Just like wars and rumors of war, globally. We've learned to live with a new normal on warfare and now pandemic. We, the church, Father, need to be about your business. We need to be about your business. We're closer to the coming of Christ than we've ever been. From a historical set set up and situation, may we be about the work of evangelism, helping others who are struggling, Christians who are full of panic and anxiety, to look to the Lord. Teach us today, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want you to write this at the top of your paper. I want you to write this at the top of your paper. All the way across the top paper, this is going to take this. Start with salvation. Write salvation. Leads to You can just draw an arrow. That arrow represents leads to sanctification. Draw an arrow. That leads to spirituality. That's the indwelling Holy Spirit. Draw an arrow. That leads to walk in newness of life. It is salvation that brings us to sanctification, one of the eight works of the Holy Spirit that takes us to spirituality, another work called the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that takes us to our subject matter today. Now, when we studied positional sanctification, we understand understood the importance of the gospel and how it affects the gospel affects retroactive positional truth, current positional truth, and experiential positional truth. It is experiential positional truth that we've launched off into uh, another study related to it called Walk in Newness of Life because of Romans 6, 3 and 4, which we introduced you to. Notice on the top of your paper, not, not, not as high, but in the first paragraph on your paper, there's two key passages on sanctification. One is 2 Thessalonians 2, 13 and 14, and the other is Romans 8, 9 through 11. These are really important to you. We use 2 Thessalonians 13, 14 to describe one of the works of the Holy Spirit, sanctification. Today, out of Romans the third, out of the sixth chapter, verse three and four, we're going to introduce you. Notice the top of your paper in the second paragraph. I want to explain this passage a little bit to you. When Paul says, or do you not know, they have been taught that, just like you have been taught on positional sanctification. You've been taught three classifications of positional sanctification. Retroactive positional truth, current positional truth, and experiential positional truth. Okay? So when Paul says, do you not know, they do know just as you know. And so this is a reminder to advance you forward. Now that you know that, let's move on. Let me advance you in your thinking. This is exactly what Paul has done, exactly what I'm doing. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ, remember this phrase, baptized into Christ is current positional truth, into Christ. You, current positional truth, the moment you believe the gospel of Christ, that he died for your sins, your sins, was buried and raised from the dead third day, the moment you believe it, you are 
in Christ. You are in Christ. At the same time that you're in Christ, through the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is in you because of your faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ, and Christ is in you. Do you hear the difference? You in Christ, Christ in you. When we studied this, if I say, do you not know, it's because you either haven't paid attention in class or you haven't been in class. <laughs> I can't do anything about the fact that you haven't been in class other than tell you you can go back and pick this up, and you probably should. When you see this little phrase, in Christ, you always pay attention to that because that you are in Christ. That's grace. You didn't earn it, didn't deserve it. You got it by the grace of God. You will always have it by the grace of God. You didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it. God gave it to you based on the propitious work of Christ, his son on the cross for your sins. So, Paul says, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Don't you know? So, in a moment, I'm going to come to the screen. I'm going to cover the screen in just a moment. Let me walk you through this. <clears throat> baptized, have been baptized. You, you're not going to be baptized into Christ, current, current positional truth, unless you've been baptized into his death. Jesus, you have to be saved in order to be sanctified. The moment you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead, qualifies you to be sanctified, set apart into the holiness of God as a way of life. As a way of life. And so he says, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ have been baptized into his death? Don't you know you can't get current positional truth unless you have retroactive positional truth? you got to believe that Christ died on that cross, was buried and raised from the dead to get into sanctification, and you're going to be baptized by the Holy Spirit into Christ. That puts you in Christ by the grace of God. You get eight works of the Holy Spirit. That's just one of them. Sanctification and baptism is two of them. Do you see that? Current positional truth is based on retroactive positional truth. He's got to die. He's going to be buried and going to be raised. And because he's raised, when you believe that he died, buried, and raised, you get the benefit of his resurrection, seated at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. You become identified with Christ. You, in Christ, your identity now in the world for time and eternity is in Christ. You are in Christ forever. We call it eternal life. Now, therefore, conclusion, therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death. Notice the word is thanatos. That puts us retroactive positional truth in order that as Christ was raised from the dead, that's nekros. We have two different Greek words for the word in English, death. And that's important. Paul knows the difference. And you do too in a moment. In order that as... Pay attention to that word, circle that little word as. As Christ was raised from the dead, necros, 
that's, that's mortal. Thanatos is spiritual. Spirit, thanatos is spiritual death. Necros is mortal death, physical death. Through the glory of the Father, Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, current positional truth, so, circle the word so, as so. Now, I can't tell you how important that is. Now, that may not seem like big words to you. Those are really big words because of comparisons. As Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too. Notice that's a double O. That's T-O-O. -O. Who are we being compared to? As so? That's a T-O-O. -O. We're being compared to Christ. Let's get a hold of this. In order that as so, see, as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk what, through his resurrection, we walk in newness of life. Experiential positional truth is based on the fact that Christ died, was buried, and raised from the dead. It's based on that fact of the gospel. <clears throat> As so, as Christ was, are we dealing with rape, being raised from the dead? <laughs> Look, in order that as so, as Christ was raised from the dead, that's necros, that's it from his physical death, you know, three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, and he was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father. And listen, we know that the, we know from Romans 8, 11 that the power that raised Jesus from the place of the dead lives inside our mortal bodies. And therefore, while we're alive, our bodies have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and, and we're capable in our mortal bodies, we are capable because of the indwelling third member of the Godhead to walk in the newness of divine life. See, the word life there is for divine. It's divine life in a mortal body. We can walk in the newness of divine life in our mortal bodies. Do you get that? Are you getting that? <laughs> now, the word walk. Notice the word is peripateo. Peripateo. Here's what peripateo means, every activity of your life. Peripateo, peri is a preposition meaning around. And so I always tell you to draw a circle, do this now, draw a little circle somewhere on your paper. I'm filling that thing up in a, draw a little circle and put a dot in the middle, that dots you. And peripateo means every activity of your life in that circle. Everything you do in that circle, which is your life. Remember the story, this is your life? That circle represents your life in peripateo, and, and it's divided up into like pies, you know, like a pie. You know, and, and it's who, you're, who you are in this world. You know, you're a son, you're a a husband, you're a brother, you're, you're employed, you go to church, you live in the community, your kids go to school, you're part of the PTA, I don't even know if they have them anymore. But, and, and, and everything, inside your, everything inside that circle is your life. You understand that? That's peripateo. You go to the grocery store, that's in that circle. You stop and get gas in your car, that's in the circle. Everything in your life's in that circle. Now let's read it again. See if we can get a hold of this. As Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too might walk. See, 
we were dead and raised in Christ, current positional truth through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, we now are indwelt by the third member that God read and can live the divine life. You see, you can live the divine life because the third member of the Godhead lives inside your mortal body. Come on now. You understand that? That is God. God is living inside your mortal body and has been since the day you believed that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day. I don't know. And listen, Paul tells you all the time, in the book of Corinthians, in the book of Romans, in the book of Ephesians, in the book of Galatians, Paul is going to preach this message everywhere. And he's going to teach it as often as he has the opportunity. As Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk Aorist active subjunctive, aorist tense is a point in time, divorce from time, it is the point of your salvation. The active voice deals with will, not my will, but God's will be done as a modus operandi of our life. That's the active voice. And the subjunctive is the potential or the importance of volition in the Christian life. You can walk in the flesh or you can walk in the spirit. But you're going to walk one way or the other. Galatians 5, 16 and 17. Right? It's a spiritual walk. You could do this walk if you had no legs. Do you understand? It's a spiritual walk. You walk in the Holy Spirit who lives inside of you. There's your walk. You walk with the Holy Spirit who lives inside of you. Now, the word baptism has been used twice in our text. So let me explain it to you. Baptizo. Let me, t let me explain the Greek word to you. Baptizo. It means that whatever you're dipped into or submerged into, you become identified with it. This word was used in the industrial world of manufacture of dye. You would take a white garment submerge it into red dye, it would come out red. It was called baptized. You understand the meaning? Anytime you find that word, you always pay attention to what it's dipped into. What is it baptized into? What is it submerged into? Because it becomes identified with it. Do you understand that? There's your word. That, that is the word. And that is the idea behind the word. And it's important that you know that. I wrote it on your paper. So when you read Romans, the sixth chapter, verses three and four, you pay attention to that. When he talks about baptism, he says, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into what? Christ Jesus, Right? means that you've become identified with him. You now are in Christ Jesus. You in Christ. And everything he's identified as, you become. He's a son, you're a son. He's eternal life, you're eternal life. He's a priest, you're a priest. You know the 20 status privileges of current positional truth? Hear the little mice running around up, up in the belly. Thing. I love the pitter patter of little feet. I can tell you that. That warms my heart. In Romans the sixth chapter three and four, this word is used twice: baptized into Christ. Therefore, we have been buried with Him through baptism into death. 
And then he goes on to explain what I just explained to you. And listen, you say, why is the death and burial and resurrection of Christ important? Listen to me, I'm going to tell you why. And I, because of John 19, 30, and 31. And boy, I have covered this out here in Moody. Christ from the cross says it is finished. He is physically alive. He has just finished the work of salvation when he says it is finished. Spiritual death is now complete. Then it says he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. He died physically. And Paul identifies his burial and resurrection. He identifies us with it in the point of our salvation in the aorist tense. Thanatos is used consistently in the scriptures by Paul to identify spiritual death and necros for mortal death, or what we would call physical death, where we do funerals. I mean, you never do a funeral for somebody spiritually dead. You probably should, <laughs> but we don't. When Jesus died on the cross, he died to conquer two deaths, a spiritual and a physical. The Bible says the physical one comes to be absent from the body at physical death is be present with the Lord. You need to really understand this stuff. I can't begin to tell you. Now, on your paper, let's go back to this one more time. The gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Christ dies. He's buried. He's raised. We're going Romans 1, 16. If you believe, you receive. And Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourself. It's a gift of God. I know you probably can't read it. You probably need to listen to me. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4 says that's the gospel. Romans 1, 16 says when you believe, you receive. Ephesians 2, 8 9 say you're saved by grace through faith and not of yourself as a gift of God. All right, that's the gospel. Okay, right there. There's the gospel. I when we're identified in the gospel, retroactive positional truth, Galatians 2.20 identifies us. I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, it's not I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. He takes you all the way through the whole gamut in that one ver verse. When were you crucified with Christ? He died 30 AD. Okay? In 30 AD. 30 AD. I don't know. I hate to turn around and even look at that thing. 30 AD. Now, whatever, whatever period, you, whatever date you got saved, like for me, it was 1961, you got identified with him who died in 30 AD. You got identified with that death. What was his death about? Your sin, my sin. And the penalty, the judgment that's going to come with it. He took it all on the cross. In our place, he died in our place for us. That's why I say to you that when you accept the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's personal. It's personal. And I'll tell you why. It's because your name written in the book of life, the moment you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, it is sealed by the blood of Christ forever. Sealed until the day of redemption. Ephesians 1, 13, 14, and 4, 30.
That sealing is another work of the Holy Spirit in Ephesians. So the moment you believe the gospel, you're identified with him in his death. Now you're, you're identified in his resurrection in current positional truth. He who was seated at the right hand of God the Father because he was raised from the dead and ascended and is seated at the right hand of God the Father today, everything that he is today seated in session with all authority given to him just read the book of Ephesians. Paul covers this subject matter enormously in that book. This is you in Christ. You in Christ. And there's 20 status privileges in that little pamphlet. 20 status privileges, you know, that 50 things pamphlet. You should study because that's who you are. And I went into great lengths. That's your closet. That's the clothes in your closet, spiritual closet. It identifies you in the world. It identifies because God knows who you are. The world needs to know. You ought to study that because that's who you are in Christ. And that's your identity in the world today. We all have identity. It's either uh, from a world standard or from a divine standard. You need to know who you are in Christ, and you ought to be comfortable in these clothes. How do I get there? Baptism of the Holy Spirit. Write these down in your paper. Under the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Write these down. Go. I promise I'm not coming back to this next week. Write down Galatians 3.27. 1 Corinthians 12.13. And Ephesians 4.5. You really need to know that. That Galatian passage is wonderful because it says in Christ we're eager. Our, our equality is in Christ. We're no, the, no longer male and female, f free and slave, you know, Jew and Gentile. We are one. We are all one in Christ. Everybody has the same clothes in the same closet in Christ. And these are the clothes you need to wear in the world to identify who you belong to. Hmm? Hmm? so you got those now that's how I get it here's the experiential positional truth a current position let me give you a key, a key verse 2 Corinthians 5.17 that's one of my favorite verses on it anyone in Christ is a new creation all things have passed away and behold, all things become new. All things become new is how you walk in newness of life. All things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. All things have passed away is prior to you believing the gospel of Jesus Christ. All things become new is after your experience with Christ believing that he died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day. And now you can walk in that newness of life. It's a powerful walk, too. It's a powerful walk. Listen. It is so important that you get this. This is basic stuff. And, and listen, if you'll, if you'll just stay with me a year, the Word of God will so transform your life if you will listen to it and apply it to your life. It will so transform your life. People will want to know who you, who have you become, and you've become the person that's wearing the clothes in the closet of Christ in the world, and they will see the difference. They will meet the priest. 
that's after the order of Jesus Christ, after the order of Melchizedek. They will meet that guy. They will meet that son of God that knows that God is their Abba Father can hit their knees in a moment and the person standing next to them can feel the power and the presence of God when that person prays. I want you to have that life. Christ died for that life for you. I want you to have that life and you can't get it apart from the study of the word of God. I want you to fall in love with the scriptures. It is a pathway unto your life. Experience your positional truth. This is based on the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Because I messed that whole thing up, I'm going to come to the bottom circle. Experiential truth. Bottom circle. This is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in you, and this is where walk, walk in, walking in the newness of life comes from, right here. Okay? A key passage for experiential truth is Romans, the 8th chapter, 9 through 11. That's a powerful passage. Okay? A powerful passage. This is, this is walk that Christian life out. Here we got the filling, the indwelling Holy Spirit. Now we need to walk him out. Walk him out of our life while we're still in the world. So, Let's write down a few passages that are important to the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. One is John 14, 16, and 17. In John 14, we're told that the Holy Spirit, when he takes up residence inside the mortal body of a believer, the Holy Spirit is permanent. He is forever. He takes up residence and is forever. He is a... Permanent, it's a permanent indwelling. Permanent. People in the Old Testament were always fearful that he would leave them because he was only temporary on them for assignments. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit did not indwell. He dwelt alongside, and he was given on assignments. And they were all fearful once they had seen the Holy Spirit fulfill an assignment of God, they were always fearful that it might be taken from them because it was such a powerful experience. We have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside our bodies to give us every moment of every day these powerful experiences, and we pay no attention to it. That bothers the stew out of me. Whatever stew, stewing in me. <laughs> That, that, that really, that really, I can't imagine why you wouldn't be interested in this. Everybody in the Old Testament, even David, oh, Father, don't take, the, don't take the Spirit from me. That can never happen in your life. The Spirit is there for the, for the ride. He's never permitted, once he takes up residence, he's never permitted to leave you. It's forever. Boy, don't miss that one. Well, I better take these verses from you. These are powerful verses. Here's one, Romans 6, chapter 3 and 4, because we're told it is in the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit that we walk in newness of life. Why would you, why would you not want to walk in the newness of life? Especially those who have walked in the oldness of it <laughs> and has beat you to a pulp. It's drug you through every cesspool in the world. Now you have a chance to live in the dynamics of the power of God in your life. And then, of course, the big one, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. What, don't you know that the Holy Spirit dwells in your body and your bodies become the temple of God? 
Your body is no longer your own. It's been bought with the price of Christ on the cross. Therefore, glorify God in your body. How do you do that? Walk in newness of life. Well, how did the, did the resurrection bring glory to God, the Father? It says it did. And the power that raised Jesus from the dead that brought glory to the Father lives inside you. Therefore, God wants your body to reflect the glory of God. He wants you to wear the clothes of the new man. The, the new creation, the new person in Christ, he wants you to live that. It's a 724 deal. And listen, you, it should make it, listen, I mean, people go like, oh, that would ruin my life. If I did that, Ron Adam, that would ruin my life. What kind of life are you talking about that it would run? The, 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 the dynamics of the indwelling, what kind of a life have you got that the ministry of the Holy Spirit of God would interrupt and cause you great pain? What kind of life have you got? Man, you live in a cesspool. You're fishing in the Dead Sea. <laughs> Lots of luck with that one. Okay? Point number two. Point number two. Every person who believes personally that Jesus died for his sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day, receives eight works of the Holy Spirit that he or she can never lose in time and eternity, recorded in the little pamphlet, 50 things that you can pick up. And I wrote, yes, I said personally. This is the reason guys like Billy Graham, Billy Sunday, and guys like this always gave invitations. I always do it when I speak on a message of the gospel. I always give, I always give a, a come forward salvation. I don't as a pastor because I, I teach for growth. And I tell you that if you believe that Jesus, if you want to believe that, and I recommend it, believe that Jesus died for your sins and buried and raised from the dead to give you salvation for time and eternity. If you will believe that, you will receive that. And I say in this church in Moody, if you've prayed, if you have prayed to receive Christ as your Savior by faith through the grace system of God, I say either come see me after class or see Willie. He gets them, he gets them every week. See Willie, he'll tell you, and he'll put you in a program of spiritual growth. But it's personal because your name has to be written and sealed in the book of life. And I put it on your paper because people say to me, well, where do you get that stuff, Ron Adema? And so I say, well, here's where I get it. Revelation 13, 8. I get it from Revelation 20, 15 and Revelation 3, 5. In Revelation 13, 8, it's called the Lamb's Book of Life. In the 20th chapter 15, your names have to be written and sealed in it. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14 and 4, 30 says that the Holy Spirit seals you unto the day of redemption. So that's pretty important. That's pretty important. Listen, I I have people I I I have people say to me, Ron, I believe that Jesus died was crucified. I believe Jesus was crucified. I say, for what reason? They say, for sin. I said, what about yours? You know why I do that? It's got to be personal. I hear a lot of people say, well, I believe Jesus was crucified. I, I, listen, I believed he was crucified and still remained an unbeliever, but I didn't accept it personally. 
I checked out a Bible and read that, they, that he was crucified. But never took it personally. I took it historically. Two years later, I took it personally and got saved. My life was changed. Old things have passed away, and I now began a life of new things. And I live in that. What's exciting to me is to be able to live, walk in the newness of life every day, something new, some, something adventurous in my life that can affect other people's lives. That's what's powerful, Willie. Willie. That's what motivates us to sit down with troubled young, young people and give them the gospel of Christ because in a split second of believing, God will take the old things away and present the new things that are coming. That's a powerful idea. Point number three. And our study on walking newness of life as we're introducing this idea to you. Our focus in this series of lessons coming is on one of the eight works of the Holy Spirit called the indwelling. You remember, this was clearly taught by Paul in Romans 8, chapter 9 through 11. You remember, he used a specific word. He, he atta attached uh, the idea uh, to this word in the 8th chapter, which we'll see in a little bit. Jesus taught on the indwelling in uh, John 14, 15, and 16. John 14, 15, and 16. In fact, John John's a, wrote a lot about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Uh, John, the seventh chapter, he wrote on it. John 14, 15, and 16. Just before he's going to the crucifixion, he, he taught heavy on it. Uh, it's one of the great go-to passages the one I'm referenced to right now is in the 14th chapter, verse 16 and 17, at Jesus, what we call his last supper uh, before his crucifixion. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another comforter. The word another in the Greek language is alas. It's on your paper, A-L-L-O-S. There's two words in the Greek language translated in English, another. And so you don't know which one it is in the English, but in the Greek you do, because alas means another of the same kind. And heteros, H-E-T-E-R-O-S, means another of a different kind. So this is really important to our passage here. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another comforter, another like the same kind. Who would that be? It would be Christ. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so another comforter, one like the same car, and he gave them the, he calls them helper or comforter. It's the word paracletus, called alongside. That he may be with you forever. You should circle that word forever. That he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth. That's a, that's a title given to him. I noticed that in my English text, they didn't uh, capitalize the T, and I always do, because, well, I try to do it, uh, because that's a title. The, holy, the indwelling Holy Spirit is called a, the Spirit of the Truth. And that's why the Holy Spirit is so important in your life in John 14, 26, to teach and recall. And it's why truth is the central. Listen, in John, write this down, John 8, 44, because it's not on your paper. This is one of those flash, the Holy Spirit, tell them John 8, 44. Because listen, he's called the spirit of truth. His main purpose is to teach you the truth from the word of God. In John 8, 44, it says the devil is a liar. He can't do anything but lie. It is his nature to lie. You understand? Know the spirit of truth is in your life to keep you from the lies of the devil. He censors stuff. We go like, no, 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 that's not true. What's the Bible say? That's not true. 
Hey, do you have that ability in your life to know what is true and what isn't? The Holy Spirit's job, he's called the spirit of the truth. The spirit of the truth. So it's a very important title, in my opinion. At least it has been in my life. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not behold him or know him, but you know him because he abides. See, he's talking about the Holy Spirit. Because he abides with you, O covenant, and will be in you. Remember, this is John 14. He's still O covenant. He will be with you. We talked about it earlier. And will soon be, is the idea will be, that's future tense, will be in you. Right? We live in that time period where Christ has died, buried, uh, raised, ascended, session, seated, at the right hand of God the Father. We live in this period. We have lived in this period since Acts 2, when the church began at Pentecost. The world cannot receive because it does not behold him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you now and will be in you soon is the idea. Paul taught it in Romans 8th chapter verse 11. He used, look at the Greek word E-N-O-I-K-E-O -E on your paper. See it? See the E-N? That's a preposition meaning in. Like you are in the building. Paul taught the indwelling, and here's how he taught it. In verse 11, if, that's a first-class condition, it's true. A first-class condition in the Greek language means, and it's true. And listen, we call that the protasis. There's an if and a then. The if is the protasis, it comes first, and then the then is an apodosis because it comes second, last. Are you with me? Yeah. So if this is true, then this is true. It, the if part is true, the then part is true. A first class condition. Listen to what he says. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, and what would we say? And he does. Then this is true. He who raised Jesus from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies. That's eternal life. Will give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who indwells. Remember, I, when I talked this before, I showed you the difference between dwell and indwell. I went through that discussion. I don't want to go back through it. But dwells in you is current positional truth. Christ in you. You in Christ, current positional truth. Christ in you, experiential positional truth. Okay. So what we have learned is that the Holy Spirit indwells every church age believer's body during the church age period. 1 Corinthians 16, 19 through 20. That should be 1 Corinthians 6, shouldn't it? Yeah, it should be 1 Corinthians 6. It shouldn't be 16. I don't know what your paper says. John always corrects his stuff. He might have missed that one. 1 Corinthians 6. What, don't you know that the Holy Spirit dwells in your body and your body is not your own business? You've been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. That's the passage. Point number four. Now, this is really important to you that are in Bible study with me. This is really important. I get to point number four. Paul made an important distinction between the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, walking by means of the Holy Spirit, and being filled by the Holy Spirit. These are three different things. They're not the same. Let me use three different. 
It's just three different words. Indwelling, like Romans 8.11 says, is a salvation gift. Now listen to me. The indwelling is never commanded. It's never commanded. The indwelling is not commanded. However, walking and filling are commanded. You got that? Man, yeah, get it. Walking by means of the indwelling is commanded. Walking by means of the in Galatians 5.16, he uses the word peripateo. He puts it in the present active imperative. That's in bold print. IMPV is an abbreviation for imperative. That's a command in the Greek language. A present imperative, the P is present, the A is active, and the rest is imperative. A present imperative, listen to me, is a standing command. It's a standing command. When I was in the military, they taught me a very important principle about life in the military. In the first eight weeks I was in the military under a draft notice. Your bed is to be made every day. That was the constant command I had to learn over eight weeks of military training for combat. Not only did your bed have to be made every day, there was a right way for it to be made. And it better be made that way every day before your day began. The right way was for the sergeant to pass by and flip a coin on it. And that coin better bounce. Or you made that bed up all over again. You might think, as I did, that's stupid. What's making a bed have anything to do with being a good soldier? Everything. Because it's following commands. Which is important in military and combat. Following commands is could be well the difference between living and dying. And to this day, <laughs> to this very day, I make my bed before I ever do anything. I don't necessarily make it where you could flip a coin on it. My day don't start until my bed's made. And I'm thankful for that lesson because it's not a lesson about a bed and it's not a lesson about how well it's made. It's a lesson of being obedient. It was one of the great lessons of my life when I met the Lord Jesus Christ about obedience. And it's a joyful thing. And by the time I got at basic, I understood the importance of making your bed correctly every day. Because it's not about beds. It's about obedience. So commands are really important. <laughs> this is a standing command. Every morning your day should start with this command. You might not think that making a bed would be important to your life, but it is about obedience. And a standing command is about obedience. 
It don't even have to make sense if you don't want it to. It don't even have to make sense if you don't want to be a philosopher of your life. It may not even make sense. Obedience is something that's important to your life. And this is a present imperative. It's a standing command. This is expected. This is how you start your day. Walking by means of the indwelling Holy Spirit, Galatians 5, 16. But I say walk by means of the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of your flesh. What a great way to start your day. And how important the present tense would be to keep that way, that day going that very way. We never did, but if I we if we'd have had a break and come back and sleep, listen, we didn't dare go back in that barrack and sleep on that bed. We slept under trees or wherever they gave you, gave you ten, take ten. We took ten wherever we could get it. But had I been privileged to go back to the barracks and take a little ten or fifteen minute nap. My bed better be made the way a coin could flip on it. Or I'd be in big trouble. But when we left the barracks, we never got back to the barracks till late in the night. Walking by means of the indwelling is commanded for spirituality. Walking in the spirit is where spirituality comes from. The doctrinal principle um, indwelling versus walking. There can be many walkings by means of the Spirit, but only one indwelling. You understand that? Indwelling is not commanded. Walking is. It's in the present tense. That's a continuous momentum. The filling, the filling by means of the indwelling Holy Spirit is commanded for spirituality in Ephesians 5.18. I want to spend a moment with you. I want you to look it up in your Bibles. Now the word for filling is pleroo. But I want you to look up this passage because I want your eyes to fasten on it because people miss this. 518. Remember that the word pleuroo uh, means to fill up a deficiency, something lacking. I'm going to read 5.18 to you. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, debauchery. But be filled with a spirit. That's Holy Spirit. Look on your paper, because I want you to draw out a circle. Draw a circle around the word with wine. And then go over and draw a circle around the word with the Spirit. Because he's contrasting these two. Watch what he says. Do not, now watch this, it's got the negative may, M-E on it, and the word drunk, do not get drunk, which is a present passive imperative, second person plural, present passive imperative, that's command. And here's what he means, he put the may on the front of it, M-E, that's a negative. And here's what he means, if you are in the habit of drinking till you get drunk and you're a believer, quit that. Stop. That's what that means. Stop. Stop. 
if you are not a person who drinks and has to be drunk, you can't quit drinking until you're drunk. If you're not that person, and you take a drink once in a while, you've got to know when to stop. Do you know when you stop? Listen, it's a sin to get drunk. It's not a sin to drink. It's a sin to get drunk. It would be a sin to drink if you're underage. Agreed? It's against the law. Jeez, come on. Man, common sense has to fit in somewhere. How do I know what point I must never pass? Well, first of all, if you have a history of drunk, then the word is stop, don't do it anymore. Don't do it at all. If you don't have a history of it, how do I know when to stop? It would be if you get a buzz. And if you don't even know what we're talking about, then don't drink at all. You won't have to worry about any of these safety guards. You understand? Because 1 Timothy 3, 3 and 8, I don't know if it's on your paper, probably not, but in 1 Timothy 3, 3, 3, 3, and 3, 8, it tells you that alcohol is a narcotic and you can become addicted to it. It's, it's a drug, a form of a drug. You become just like anything else. If you have in your flesh a power lust for that, stay away from it completely. Don't even mess with it. It's not necessary for your life. Don't mess with it. And if you want to have a, a drink once in a while, remember it can be it can be addictive if you're not careful. If you drink for the wrong reasons, you know you can drink a coke or you can drink your beer or whatever. But you, listen, there's a point when you feel the buzz, you're done. You say, "Well, yeah, but I just paid five dollars. I don't care." <laughs> This ain't about money. It's not about money. If you get that buzz, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, don't start. Don't do it at all. You don't have to do it at all. Don't do it at all. But you got to know this stuff. And this is what the writer is talking about. Listen to what he said. Don't get drunk on wine. Don't get drunk with wine. Don't, don't, don't get high on anything but the Holy Spirit. Agreed? Well, look, it's what he said. I, I, look, do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. Drunkenness is debauchery. But be filled, present active imperative, but be filled. The alternative to that is the Holy Spirit of God. Listen, people go like, look, look, I have a, Ron, I've, 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 I have a problem with, narcotics or whatever it is, whatever drug is your, your choice, all of this is a distraction to what God really... The devil has a distraction to what really brings the joy in time and eternity is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Look. Write this down. Maybe I wrote this for you. I, 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 I'm, I take care of you, people. How does the world? How does the world fill their life? Well, for some, write down. Did I write down uh, Deuteronomy twenty one twenty? Deuteronomy twenty one twenty says. There are two things you have to be aware of that are called body lust. You know, Galatians 5, 16, 17. 
If you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the, the desires of the flesh. Deuteronomy 21.20 tells you that there are two bodiless trends you must be aware of. And you must be careful of these two. They both present hazardous health issues to your life. Gluttony and drunkenness, they're both body lust and they're both dangerous to your health, your well-being, your physical well-being. Gluttony, overeating, and drunkenness. And so Paul is dealing with this issue in the church. Like I am today with you. See, what's the world's solution to your problems? Drugs. Alcohol. Uh, pain pills. Whatever. Right? That's the world's solution. You know who runs the world? Tell me, tell me, please, you know who runs the world. Do you know the scripture? 1 John 5, 19. Be one. His substitute. The same thing with look, people get full of anxiety. Listen, here's the typical thing they do. Here's typical. Here's what people get, get into anxiety, get into stress. When they, they reach for a cigarette, they reach for a drink or drug. Right? Or food. All body lust. They're all body lust. And they develop trends in your life. This is my choice. You hear people say, this is the drug of my choice. You know, I used to have a friend who used to say that uh, smoking, the cigarette wasn't what, what was bad. It was the person sucking on him. <laughs> the cigarette is not going to change, but the person sucking on him should. <laughs> oh, yeah. Look, the world has an answer to all of your stress problems. Drugs, so you don't have to deal with it. But everybody knows that drugs has a problem, a life of its own that destroys your life. So come out of the woods, dear hearts. Come out of the woods. The answer, listen to me now, the answer is what? What's Paul's answer? To the Christian, what's his answer? The indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. It's not law that says don't do it. It's choose a different path. Right? What is the church's answer to the alcohol and drug problem? It is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It's the indwelling third member of the Godhead that wants you to live in the newness of life, not the oldness of it. <clears throat> Go one book back to the fifth chapter of Galatians 16 and 17. Listen, you got an old sin nature, you're going to have it until you die or the Lord comes back. The question is not that you have an old sin nature that has lust patterns and trends. That's human nature. It's how do you solve it? How do you control it? And the answer is by the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. Look at Galatians 5, 16, 17. I say walk, that's a command, by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. It, listen, your flesh is going to start with a desire, and then it's going to develop a trend. 
And we call that trend, if it's sinful, like if it's alcohol, a drunkard, or if it's food, it's gluttony, for example. And listen, at some point, you become identified with your trend. You become identified as a druggie or an, a drunkard or, or a fat person or gluttony or however it is. You become identified like that. I saw uh, through television the other night, and I saw it being advertised of uh, a uh, 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 600-pound woman. I thought, well, what does she what does she think is the cause of that, and what is the solution to it? You can have a 600-pound drug addict. That that's the amount he consumes a year. What's his answer? It's the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. Watch this now. Galatians 5, 16, 17. I say walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry, you will not. That's a promise. You will not. And here's why. Verse 17. For the flesh sets its desires against the Spirit. These are in conflict. And the Spirit against the flesh, for these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please, Write this down. At some point, study Romans, the seventh chapter, fifteen to the verse fifteen to twenty-five, because when he says, "and so that you cannot do what you please," he's going to talk about this in another another text, Romans seven fifteen through twenty-five. Now. My Aunt Bice was not my really my true aunt. She was a lady in my congregation. In another church. Who was a sweetheart. Everybody in the community called her Aunt Bice. She was Aunt Bice. That's the only way. In fact, I didn't even know what her last name is. I was with her four years, and still don't know what her last. I, I may have heard it. Maybe Bice was her last. I don't know. She was called Aunt Bice, and I went by that. And everybody in the community called her. She was everybody's aunt. She was a wonderful lady, and she had some of the greatest one-liner one kind of things in the whole wide world. She said she grew up in the age of the Depression, And so she had this wonderful little poem. And as a young pastor, every time I went to visit her, I always got more from her than I ever gave to her. And she would give these little poems out. And I would make her repeat them because I was writing as fast as I could write because they were zingers. There's a little drinking place and one that you can close. That little drinking place is on your face just beneath your nose. That was a singer. That was one of her singers. Tobacco is an Indian weed, and from the devil it doth proceed. It will steal your money, burn your clothes, make a chimney out of your nose. She was wonderful. She was wonderful. And she has an enormous influence on it. I would take her... She was up into age when I was there, and I didn't even know what her age was, but she's whatever what it was, it wasn't in her mind, I can tell you that. And when I'd have youth meetings, I would bring her and she would give these, she would zing these all all the time. I brought her all the time to my youth meetings I had when I met with the youth. I said, Amby, give us one today. And boy, she had tons of them. She had tons of them. She she could she could give one that was it didn't matter what I was teaching on or whatever, she could have one. She she could put a zinger on. It was the best thing I ever seen. And so I shared that with you. Let me tell you what you get when you walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, which we will talk about in the days to come. You will get Galatians 5, 22, 23. Now you should write that down. If you've ever had an addictive problem, you should write this down. Because this goes with Galatians 5, 16, and 17. You drop down to 22, 23. 
Here's what you know this when I tell you this is the nine fruit of the Spirit. Watch this though. Here's Paul Zinger. This is one of his. Look at the very last one. Look at the very last, look at the ninth one. See it in the English? What is it? Self-control? Self-control is a fruit of the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit of God. You say to me, well, well I, I, can't, I just can't give it up. I can't do it. I don't. I know. In your flesh you can, but in your spirit you can because he will give you what? Self-control. And it's a powerful thing because it comes from the Holy Spirit. It doesn't come from you. It comes from him. And it overcomes you. Now, you got to put that process in your head. You have the Holy Spirit living in you. You got it at salvation. You want to walk in newness of life? Yeah. You have baggage? Yeah. What's it in? It's in some kind of trend that has dominated your life based on a desire that came from your flesh. An appetite. You've got to switch that off in your inner dia dialogue. When that thing comes up and you go like, oh, I'm, I'm a little... Listen... People get into bad habits either when they're depressed or when they're extremely happy. They either go out and get drunk when they're really happy or really bad, sad. Neither is a good choice. But going to the ministry of the Holy Spirit, He controls your desires of the flesh. You've got to do that. You have to volitionally submit to Him. You got to make your bed in the morning. Come on now. You got to make your bed in the morning. And if you mess it up in the afternoon, you got to make it before you leave. And the Holy Spirit has the power, right? Galatians 5, 16, 17 has the power over the flesh. You don't have power over the flesh. Holy Spirit does so. And these two are in conflict. So it's important that you get on page with this in your life in order for me to take you to the walk in the newness of life. You've got to know how to get into the walk. And then I'll show you the newness of life. I, I've been, I, I'm hinting on the newness of life. You don't have to live in the old way. You can live in the new way. You can live in the newness of life. And it's not, it, listen, it's not going through rehabs and all that kind of stuff. All that does is try to reform you. I'm talking about transforming you, not reforming you. I'm talking about transforming you. I'm not interested in reformation. That just, that, all that does is clean up the pig until it rains again. As soon as it rains, he's back to a pig. I'm talking about transform your life so it's no longer you who live, but Christ lives in you. That's transformation. And we're going to talk about that in the weeks to come. I'm going to help you. This is your journey. I'm going to help you walk through it, and I'm going to walk you slow through it. And we're going to learn how to beat the devil at his own game. We're going to beat him at his game. Okay? Okay.